Hey everyone, Jack Keeper here, and today in this video I want to talk about the six applications that allowed me to break free from Windows and go to Linux full-time. So it was back in 2011, roughly, or 2012, when I got to the point where I was getting kind of tired of using Windows and putting up with all the spyware and all the other crap that I had to deal with, and it really got kind of old when I would get a new computer and it would run great for about the first three or four months and all of a sudden it started running like crap. <laughs> Even with your uh, antivirus and everything else, which also hogged resources, um, I would still get infections and even without infections I would still slow down. It just seems to be the nature of their kernel, I guess. Um, you just start building up cobwebs and crap and uh, it just gets really slow and unmanageable. So I finally got to the point where I kind of wanted to break from it. And I didn't really want to go Mac, even though I had a MacBook and I liked my MacBook a lot, but uh, Mac was still proprietary and the open source idea really appealed to me. For one thing, if there was a security vulnerability of some sort in an open source community, you got thousands of developers out there that all around the world that can just get on it and nail it just like that. Whereas if you have a closed source team like with Microsoft or, you know, even Mac, I suppose, if some kind of vulnerability came out, it could be months before they patched it because you just have a small team of proprietary developers and they're going to decide if something's important or not. And they may not even catch wind of it right away. Whereas in the open source community, uh, you hear about things very quickly. So, you know, it's just little combinations of things like that just really made a difference. And I had been playing with Linux probably since the 90s, actually, just kind of off and on, but not really seriously. It was just kind of a novelty for me. And I'd get in there and download a, an ISO every once in a while and play on it and say, yeah, that's kind of cool. But, you know, really didn't see any reason to switch from Windows. And then probably near 2010 or so, Ubuntu was something I was playing with more and more. Uh, a friend had turned me on to it like back in probably 07, <laughs> probably, I don't know. And I think I even played with it back when it first came out. Yeah, Ubuntu was uh, something that I was interested in in the beginning because it seemed like the first really kind of cutting edge looking Linux that I saw at the time where the other stuff, you know, look kind of had a, a hokey look to it compared to like Windows, at least in my opinion. But then again, you know, I didn't play with it as much as other people. So it might've just been my choice of distros or whatever. So playing with Ubuntu was a lot of fun. And ultimately I didn't stay with it because it seemed like the applications, and this was later down the line, were really kind of, behind the times, you know, he might have something like uh, version five might be the latest of some app, like an office app. And then, you know, Ubuntu's repositories would have like four, you know, so <laughs> and that was a turn off. And I ran it as a dual boot. So I kept my Windows operating system, but I had Linux on another partition because I was getting interested enough at this point where I thought, I want to play with Linux more and I got to the point where I would just boot into Linux and I would use Linux until I had to do something that depended on Windows like maybe I had to do something in Photoshop make a label or something so then I'd boot back into Windows to do my label or if I had to RDP in somewhere to another U Windows computer I'd have to go into Windows and so I found myself jumping back and forth a lot and it got to the point where I was booting into Linux more often than I was in Windows because the experience was so much nicer in Linux. My internet was much faster, page loads were much quicker, uh, I could surf faster, um, I could just do everything faster and I didn't have to worry about spyware and viruses and all that other stuff creeping up on my computer and I used only a fraction of the resources that I used on Windows. But, you know, there was still that thing where I, every so often, I still had to go back into Windows to do certain things. And so that was 
the only downside. And one day I thought, man, wouldn't it be nice if I could just use the Linux full time and not have to go back into Windows? I wonder if that's really possible. You know, are there alternatives to what I'm using? Because what I depended on in Windows was Photoshop. I think I was using Illustrator uh, to an extent. But then, you know, I had MS Office 2010 at the time, and I needed that. And so, you know, I, I wasn't really sure if, if you could, but I thought that'd be really neat if you could. And I remember at the time, LibreOffice was available, but there was some reason I couldn't use Libre, and I don't remember what it was now. But, um, I mean, for some of the stuff that I needed, uh, there was something in Excel that didn't work in Libre. So, you know, the LibreOffice, even that, I, I had to go into Windows for certain things Office related as well. It was like uh, intriguing the thought that maybe I could go into Linux and maybe find substitutes for all these. So, yeah, I was like, okay, let's see what I can do about that. So I started kind of jumping down that rabbit hole to see if there was anything good down there. <laughs> And I made these discoveries. So then when I decided, let's see if, you know, this is a viable Windows alternative. And so I looked a little bit more. I kind of heard about the Wine layer. That's a compatibility layer that allows you to run Windows applications in Linux. So I kind of started playing around with that a little bit. What can I run in Wine? I was really surprised at the things you could run. I had even found out that you could run Office 2010 in Wine. But man, it was a bit of work to get it set up and configured. And I thought, geez, if I wasn't technically inclined, I'm not even sure if I would have bothered. <laughs> but I did manage to get it working. And it wasn't long after that when I discovered a wine-related app called Play on Linux. And Play on Linux, for me, was a game changer for wine-based applications. Now I started thinking, hmm, you know, this could be something that could get me a lot closer to breaking from Windows. And Play on Linux, this is Play on Linux. I'm running a dark theme right now, and it really doesn't look good with Play on Linux. Yuck. But I guess for the sake of demo here. So I discovered, and when I discovered Play on Linux, it made setting things up so much easier. For example, Office 2010, which was a huge chore back then, was pretty much effortless on Play on Linux. In Play on Linux, I could either download the installer and then select install a program. It would let you choose a 32-bit or 64-bit uh, version of Wine, your environment and all that. You could even choose versions of Wine, which way back then was probably like, I don't even, re <laughs> even remember, probably like Wine 3 something. But, you know, there was several versions you could choose from, newer versions, older versions, what have you. But you could also go here into install and you had all these categories. And so for example, if I wanted to install my Office 2010, all I had to do was click on Office here and scroll down to Office 2010, select that and hit the install. And then I could just install my Office application and it would put in all the dependencies and all those things like IE6 and I can't remember what all it needed, but it needed a bunch of wine things that I had to set up manually before. And this just did it all for me. And bam, there was Office. And I was like, wow. And then I discovered my Photoshop, which I had to use all the time. I could install just as easily just by clicking on graphics and then jumping over here and finding my Photoshop install. Back then, I think I was using CS6 maybe. Uh, yeah, here we go. So I could just click on that baby and install my Photoshop and I was good to go. And they both ran beautifully, you know, didn't have any real issues. The only issue I really had was with Office 2010, if I had a really big Excel file that had a lot of information in it, it would run really slow. So that was kind of the downside at the time, but eh, it was something I could live with even though it was kind of slow indexing. But, you know, it was, it was livable at the time. So it was enough to get me to say, there's two things checked off my list. 
that I don't have to depend on in Windows. So that was a huge step for me. So I was really cool with that. And so just kind of jumping that off to the side. So that was my first step to freedom. <laughs> and I don't mean to sound like a Windows basher because, you know, Windows is a great environment for some people. Uh, just not really for me. But there are people out there that depend on Windows and, you know, they got applications, maybe they're proprietary applications where they work or whatever. But, you know, there's a lot of situations where Windows is the only option and it serves a lot of people very well. I'm just not one of those people that are really suited for the Windows lifestyle. And so that's why I made the break. So enough with all that. Back to where I was. So then I got starting to think, I wonder if I could have alternative to these Wine applications here. I know now that Photoshop and Office 2010 work now in the Wine environment, so I can actually use it on Linux. That pretty much got me to where I pretty much never went into Windows, almost. And so that was nice. Is there an open source alternative that I could use full time outside of those? I knew that LibreOffice wasn't really an option uh, because of whatever the issue was at the time, which I don't recall. However, after doing a little bit of research, maybe a lot of research, I tried a lot of different open source apps and I came across, finally, WPS Office. And that was the one thing that allowed me at the time to break away from Microsoft Office. And the reason for that is because WPS Office allowed me to use the same formulas in Excel that I was using at the time in Microsoft. And those same formulas worked in WPS Office. And to me, I was like, wow, I can actually use these same things and my spreadsheets still just work. So that was huge. And it also could sort by color, you know, and it seemed like none of these other apps that I was using at the time could do that. And LibreOffice couldn't do that. I even remember Googling for it. And uh, one of the Libre developers was answering somebody that was asking the same question and they said that they were not interested in even pursuing that feature because however the LibreOffice was designed, it was too complicated to even mess with it. So I knew that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> but with WPS Office, I could. And a bonus using Garuda is WPS Office is available in Garuda's community downloads. So that's really great because I've never had a distro where I could get a community download of WPS Office. I've always had to either go through the AUR in Arch or go out to the website directly and download like an executable, like an RPM or a DEB, depending on you know what, what distro I was on. And I had to do it that way. It's available in the community repositories here on Garuda. And I think that is a huge plus. Thanks Garuda, that was a big, <laughs> Double thumbs up. So, yes. So WPS Office was the game-changing thing that got me off of Office 2010. So then I no longer had to depend on Wine, which wasn't really a bad thing. I mean, there's a lot of Windows applications that run even faster in Wine than they do in their native Windows environment. That's kind of a mind blower, but yeah, some applications do. And with Play on Linux, it makes it so easy to just go in here and select from any of these guys. You know, development, uh, you got all this, all kinds of stuff. You know, educational apps, uh, games, a uh, gazillion games, because Play on Linux is kind of, was intended for games originally, I think, anyway. Uh, thus the name Play on Linux. Your graphic apps and internet. Uh, multimedia and so there's so many things that you can install that are already pre-configured here for you that be a lot harder to do if you just had to set it up in wine by itself so yeah play on linux the other thing that i had to find an alternative for photoshop even though i was running it in wine i wanted to see if maybe i could use an alternative something open source and so that's what kind of led me into GIMP, which is the GNU Image Manipulation Program. And back in 2011, 2012-ish, after using Photoshop, I wasn't real keen on GIMP. You know, I was like, it kind of felt clumsy for me. 
and didn't have the intuitiveness of Photoshop, but I kind of played with it off and on. And actually, the more I played with it, and probably the more GIMP evolved as well, the more I really started warming up to it and realizing, man, you know, some of the things in here are easier than to do than Photoshop. And now I wasn't one of those Photoshop, um, I don't know, space aliens that do all kinds of crazy stuff that maybe only 50 people on the planet do. I was just your average user that did basic stuff like working with layers and manipulating photos, doing the basic stuff, you know, cutting and pasting and cropping and using the, the magic wand to maybe remove a background or something. So, you know, I kind of did all the, the basic stuff that people do. So using GIMP after a while just became so easy. And there were things like, uh, you know, crop to image, crop to selection and stuff like that that I really started liking. And all the filters that I really needed were right here in GIMP also. And so I had all these options. You know, if I needed to work with a PNG file, something with a transparent background, it was as easy as just jumping into my advanced options, going down to fill with here for your background. And instead of having a background color, I can change that to transparency and hit OK. And then I'd have a transparent background where I could make a, a PNG file. Maybe I have another picture open over here and copy something from that picture and paste it into here. So I had something with no background. So, you know, things like that. So again, turned out to be, you know, and it has all the brushes over here that I would ever use, just like in Photoshop. And there's really nothing that I didn't do before in Photoshop that I can't do in GIMP. The toolbar was a little different, of course. And then I discovered when you click on these tiny little arrows, right click on them, you know, you can kind of see other things like here you have your free select is where it is by default. Your scissors select is really cool because it'll, you can kind of click around the outside edges of whatever part of the picture you're trying to grab and the scissors will just kind of stick to those edges and shape itself. So that way when you make a cut, it just will shape itself to whatever it is you're outlining. And so that's really cool. I just like the scissors tool. <laughs> and so I'm getting a little carried away. But anyways, this turned out to be a great viable alternative to Photoshop for me. So that kind of solved that problem. So now I was getting to the point where I felt like, you know, I'm almost never going into Windows now. And so being that I'm almost never going into it, I wonder if I could just get rid of it, you know, but eh, there was still that nagging thing. Ah, and that was RDP. I was still having to RDP into, you know, other computers. And so RDP didn't really seem like a protocol that was part of the whole Linux thing. Hmm. What am I going to do about that? So then I did a little bit of Googling and discovered that there was a app called XRDP at the time, I think is what I first started with. That was the thing that led me to discover that, yes, RDP was possible in Linux as well. Nice. And then after that, I kind of moved on to Remina. I discovered that later. And I think I'm pronouncing that right. Remina allows you to use other desktops remotely. And it not only allows you to use the RDP protocol, but other things too, like VNC and uh, I forgot what all, but it's really feature rich. And of course, it's absolutely free and open source, copy left it and Libre and all that good stuff. So that kind of became my go-to app for any kind of remote access. And from time to time, I've used TeamViewer in the past too. And TeamViewer runs just fine on Linux. I have no issues with it. So that's another alternative. But for RDP, I was using Remina quite often. So that kind of solved that problem for me. That was another one checked off. <laughs> Once I was able to use those basics, then I was pretty confident that I wouldn't need to go back into Windows. In fact, I found myself not really kind of ever going back into Windows. Another app was that was Adobe based that I liked was Illustrator. And so that leads me to my other app, Inkscape. 
Inkscape is a great application. It's probably one of my favorite all around uh, graphic illustrating applications. And this is vector based uh, as opposed to raster like the GIMP software. Vector means that if you make a picture and it's like really small and then you increase it to really big, it retains its same sharpness. It doesn't pixelate as it gets bigger because it's a different type of technology. And so when I was private labeling products, maybe I needed to make a label for a manufacturer so they could have something to work with. Inkscape was what I would use to tweak it with. I actually paid people on Fiverr to do the design, so I didn't mess with all that. But if I needed to tweak something, I could open it up here in Inkscape. And I was also able to work with Adobe Illustrator documents to a limited extent. Uh, it does have some support for AI. So if I got an AI document, I could import it into Inkscape. And I think I had to use a plugin for that. I can't remember now, but somehow I would open the AI document and then I would save it as an SVG because that's the native format that Inkscape wants to use as an S SVG. And then I would simply export. Now for manufacturers like on Al Alibaba or whatever, I would just leave it as an SVG or you know, save it as a PDF, which also worked for them. Yeah, Inkscape, just beautiful. And I also use it to make my thumbnails for my videos. I use it for creating logos. I use Inkscape for everything. It's just a fantastic application. And so that really kind of sealed the deal for me. After that, I really couldn't think of any reasons to go back to Windows. And after a few months of never going into Windows while I was home. It was kind of a no brainer. And by that time my computer died. <laughs> so I ended up getting a new computer and I set it up on my desk there and I turned it on and it was all fancy smancy and here came Windows 8. And it was like, Windows 8, ta-da. Wow, yeah, pretty. And I got on there and I used Windows 8 for well over probably 27 minutes, maybe 27 and a half, hard to say. And then I said, okay, that was entertaining. Now I'm putting Linux on. So I threw in a CD. Yes, a CD, because it was that long ago, <laughs> like 2012 probably, give or take. So I popped in a CD, installed Linux. You know, at the time that first install was a single partition right over the whole thing. It was purely Linux. So that was the moment that I cut the cord and I went full-time Linux. And I didn't really have any issues. I, there was no reason that I had to stop what I was doing and jump on a Windows machine to do something. I was 100% weaned from the Windows environment by that point. So that was a huge thing. My wife didn't come over so fast. She was still a Windows user and I told her about the Linux and what I did and she was like, yeah, that's nice. Uh, yeah, that is nice. Wow. You know, how would you like to do it? No, I don't like change. Change is a bad thing. <laughs> no change. <laughs> I'm like, mm, okay. She was always having trouble on Windows all the time, but you know, to each his own. So I just kind of let it go. And probably six or seven months later, she couldn't stand it anymore. She got to the point where it was like, she'd go get a cup of coffee just until her Excel document would load. And, <laughs> you know, I was constantly cleaning off byware and all kinds of malware that would, she would get on her computer all the time. And uh, it was stuff that would just get past the antivirus and you know, any malware stuff I had on there. And her computer was just so bogged down with crap. And even the antivirus was bogging down the computer. And so it was just a real headache for her. Finally, she hit that breaking point and said, uh, why don't you ever have these headaches? And I said, well, because I'm using Linux, remember? Oh, yeah. Let me take a closer look at that. What are you doing? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you run office? Can you blah, blah, blah? Oh yeah, sure, I can do this, this, this. And she's like, do it, do it. I'm so frustrated, just, I don't care what it takes. Just change my computer over. So I did. And after I did that, she was amazed. I mean, she spent like three days just raving about it, saying 
how fast their internet is, you know, and I'm like, I know it, right? It's so cool. And how fast their apps were opening up and everything was so responsive, boom, boom, boom. Open up in her huge Excel document and boom, right there. She was just flat out amazed. She raved about it for weeks, I'm telling you. She was an instant fan and she had no regrets. She never looked back, just like me. That also pretty much covers everything. I guess if I was just gonna touch on a couple of other things, if you're an Office user and you think, wow, it'd be kind of cool if I could just kind of jump onto an OS like Linux, uh, but I gotta have my Outlook. Without Outlook, forget it, you know. I don't really like email clients. I prefer just using uh, web-based, you know, like Gmail or whatever. However, I understand why people want their client. You know, they like having their calendar and their contact list and everything right there on the machine. And, you know, they're comfortable in their Outlook world. And I do get that. And there are solutions on Linux for that as well. One of them that's really good is called Evolution. And Evolution is an email client that looks very much like Outlook. It's very Outlook-ish. And it has all that stuff in there, the contacts and the calendar. And yeah, I'm trying to find it here. I thought they had a picture on this website, but I'm not really seeing a picture of it. Okay, here we got some uh, pictures here. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, so these are... Here's a picture of Evolution. I mean, if that's not... If that's not Outlook looking, I don't know what is. So, you know, something like this is very feature rich. You got your contacts, your calendars, memos, tasks, and of course it's free and open source. So you really don't need Outlook if you want to go on Linux. Here's an alternative. I'm not 100% sure, but I think you might be able to import your, your Outlook database into Evolution, but I'm not sure. Uh, another alternative to Outlook would be Thunderbird. Thunderbird, pretty much the same thing. I'm not sure if it has all the features like contacts and calendars. Uh, like I said, I re haven't really looked into either one of them in forever because I don't really get into uh, email clients, but I just wanted to throw that in there. And I guess the only other thing would be like development. When I was in Windows, I didn't really use Visual Studio for anything serious because I didn't want to be chained to Windows. I liked my apps to be uh, usable in other platforms like Linux and uh, Mac OS. I liked messing with Python, although Python was uh, back in 2011, 2010, and before. <laughs> uh, Python was just, for me, it really sucked having to set it up in Windows. Uh, it was a real pain. And I was kind of a beginner back then anyway with Python, so that made it all the more complicated. And it was not a fun experience, I remember that. Um, that's why I'm bald. I started out with a full head of hair and after I got Python installed, this happened. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating just a tad. But anyways, Python is installed pretty much in every distro on Linux, so it's not even a, a point of worry if you're on Linux. It's like a natural habitat for Python. <laughs> Linux. That really made life easier. Oh yeah, I didn't really change a lot. Now I know Visual Studio, the licensing is really nice. If you're making less than a million dollars a year, you can use it for free. Visual Studio has probably one of the most beautiful designers on the planet. Um, it's pretty bloated, but you know, it's a heck of a nice piece of IDE. <laughs> Uh, I just don't want to be chained to the Windows environment or .NET and all that. So I like the freedom of the alternatives. So with that, I hope this video was helpful. If you happen to be curious about Linux and making a jump to it, and even wondering if it was possible to make a break from Windows, maybe you might feel now that, yeah, maybe it is possible. If you're in that impossible situation where you'll never be able to escape it, my condolences. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> like I said, I'm not a Windows basher. I think, uh, you know, I might sound like one, but it is a great operating system for the right people and for the right environment. Um, wouldn't be my choice if I was going to 
be concerned about security or, you know, things like that, especially in a server environment. But, you know, I could be all wet. You know, I'm saying that as somebody that's never tested server 2019 or whatever the latest release is. <laughs> I'm probably going on antiquated information. So there you have it. I hope this was helpful and hope somebody got some benefit out of this. This is my experience, what allowed me to get away from Windows and go full time into Linux without any anxieties. So I hope that helped. And if you found this video helpful or if you just found it entertaining, don't forget to give me that thumbs up and hit that subscribe button too while you're at it. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.